think you increase the speed. Press a little harder. I'll do it for you. Yeah. A little more speed. Oh, you're more. really pressing. Yeah. Oh, after your story. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer! I am not a health expert. This video is in no way intended to promote the use of illegal substances in any country. The purpose of this video is harm prevention. People are going to use these substances regardless of legality or professional therapeutic sessions, so I want to make sure that if they're going to do so, they do so safely and affordably. No part of this video depicts me using any drugs in any way. A big part of what this channel will be focusing on this year is psychedelic therapy in its many forms. To start this off, I'm going to attempt to describe microdosing properly, to the best of my knowledge. First off, let's look at how to properly microdose lysergic acid diethylamide. Because acid is water soluble, you can dilute it in a glass of water for perfect dosages every time, instead of playing this game where we try to cut it up into tiny little pieces and hope we get the right dose every time. Also, if the acid is not completely distributed properly across the tab, this will also address that issue because it'll disperse properly in the water. Now for this, you can use any amount of water you like, just be sure to label the container that you keep it in, and try to use metric measurements of 10, it just makes it easier to count. So a normal tab is about 100 UG to 150, so if you put that into a 10 ounce glass of water, you can take one ounce of that and that'll be a 10 ounce dose. 10 to 15, which is a normal microdose for lysergic acid. So you can use an eyedropper or a small turkey baster to measure out an ounce of water every day and just do that. Not every day, but once every two to three days for uh, three to four months is what typically is recommended for microdosing. Now that applies to acid as well as mushrooms. I don't want to say any more about that with other drugs because we just don't have the data in yet. This dosage method seems to be most common and this is what's used in the experiments that I'll be referring to later. I mean, this makes sense that we should be taking long substantial breaks and it's funny, this is actually what we're supposed to be doing with the antidepressants as well, uh, coming off of them after three, three to four months of use. Though unfortunately, I don't see many people following those instructions too carefully. So when it comes to magic mushrooms, we can actually save a substantial amount of money with the lemon tech method. Now this is a method that employs uh, an auto-catalyzation of the psilocybin into psilocin before it's actually ingested. This method is usually used for macrodosing, but it works the same for microdosing, you just use less. The first thing to do is to get a coffee grinder and take all of your mushrooms and make sure they're completely dry and grind them into a powder, and I mean a very fine powder. You want to be careful not to inhale this through your nose because it can cause a lot of mu mucus production and just seems to be irritating to the nasal passages. Measure out how much you want to take and squirt a little bit of lemon extract into a mug or something preferably with a kind of rounded bottom just because it makes it easier for things to settle together and not get caught on the sides. When you mix the mushrooms into the lemon it will look a little something like this. Granted this is a macro dose and not mushrooms, but it will be somewhat of this consistency. Mix in the psilocybin, and the acids in the lemon will actually pre-catalyze the psilocybin into psilocin. Mushrooms are already kind of hard to digest as they are, so for people with digestive issues such as myself, this is actually a really good benefit as well. I've actually gotten down to only using 0 0.003 to 0 0.005 grams versus the 0.3 to 0.5 grams of psilocybin cubensis that I used to use. When it comes to macrodosing, this method actually results in me only using 1.7 to two grams for a noticeable hallucinatory effect, like a, a noticeable dosage. I should also note that there is no one prescribed dosage that works for everyone. That's kind of how it should be with all medicine if you think about it. The amount necessary to gain benefits while the effect still being imperceptible will vary based on the individual. This is especially true with LSD because the microgram scale is much more precise than the milligram scale. And of course, before doing any of this, test your drugs. I'll be providing plenty of testing kit options and links to help you with this in the description. Honestly, you don't have to test very much if you're using the same source and the same thing and you're preserving it correctly. Uh, just to note about preservation for a second, you can freeze mushrooms in a jar or whatever uh, for around a year, it seems. And with lysergic acid, it seems that uh, the shelf life is a little longer than that and it can be contained in a cold, dark area, not necessarily frozen. One big piece of advice I really can't disagree with is the idea of taking a journal of what's going on while you're microdosing. These may be some of the most important weeks and months of your life that you're going through. This is when you'll be making substantial changes, uh, elimination of addictions, addressing of OCD and body-focused repetitive behaviors, anxiety and depression relief, PTSD. All of these are going to be uh, be changing in some way for you, most likely. So it's in your best interest to probably take notes of that. And while you're at it, take notes of what you're eating and, and how you feel based on this type of sleep that you get, this type of diet that you're eating, and the exercise that you're getting. Honestly, we should be journaling everything, <laughs> but it can obviously be very challenging to keep up with all that with the kind of busy lives we all tend to live in the 21st century. 
Now let's take a look at some of the nascent research on microdosing as opposed to macrodosing. There's only a few studies out because this is a relatively new field to be studying. I have three main studies I'll be referring to, and each is compromised by either lack of funding, anonymity, or a lack of federal funding from the NIH. Because of this, much of the data is based on case studies and personal testimonial. That said, the parameters set forth by these studies seem to be quite sound and very well planned. Okay, here's some successful research on microdosing. So, Successful research on microdosing. The first microdosing study consisted of about 253 volunteers and was taken via online surveys. The participants were all either new to microdosing or had taken a four month break prior. I'm gonna drop a little bit of data here, but all of this is very relevant, I promise you. Total of 117 participants, or 46% of the, the participants, reported to have been diagnosed with one or more of the 15 specified psychiatric disorders, which were major depressive, depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety disorder, panic disorder, serious phobias, such as agoraphobia or social phobia, substance abuse disorder, alcohol dependence, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, psychotic disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, OCD, eating disorders, and PTSD. The most prevalent reported disorders across the sample population were major depressive disorder, which was 26%, and anxiety disorder, which was 24%, followed by ADHD and PTSD, which were both around 10%. To quote the abstract from this study, the current study provides the first perspective exploration of microdosing in naturalistic settings and is, to our knowledge, the first to highlight the role of positive expectations in predicting pertinent psychological outcomes linked to psychedelic drug use. Consistent with previous reports and our own hypotheses, Positive changes in well-being, depressive symptoms, state anxiety, and emotional stability were observed following four weeks of microdosing. Further, positive changes in agreeableness, social connectedness, nature-relatedness, resilience, delusional ideation, and psychological flexibility were observed in exploratory secondary analysis." End quote. Here's a little chart, and I'm going to be throwing up some more of these charts along the way just to show you uh, how they were tracking this and what progress we actually saw. What this chart shows is increases in measurements provided by the Warwick-Edinburgh Mental Well-Being Scale and decreases in anxiety and depression provided by the Inventory of Depressive Symptomology and the Spielberger State Trait Anxiety Inventory. These are some of the latest data on microdosing studies. It's still a relevantly nascent area of research as most studies are being conducted on macrodosing currently. From what I've come to conclude, both macro and microdosing seem to have similar revelatory and symptom relieving effects and act as an active placebo in aiding the cognitive reframing process. Perspective seems to be widened by both, and by my own experience, both provide mental clarity, vast improvements in memory, and ability to recall forgotten words, of which may be the result of possible enhancements of the Broca's and Wernicke's areas. So what we're seeing on this online study versus the placebo-controlled studies seems to be slightly more positive results from the personal testimonials of people filling out a 43-minute survey on the matter, so the very de detailed survey they took. The next study was conducted by the Center for Psychiatry, the Computational, Cognitive, and Clinical Neuroscience Lab, and the Department of Medicine in 2018. They seem to have found a link between depression relief and amygdala activity that occurs during the intermediate psilocybin doses. The researchers studied brain flow changes and also noticed activity in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and other default mode network areas. This study incorporated different doses of psychedelics and had a lot of similar results between the different doses, so they reported a lot of evidence for positive psychological changes in end-of-life anxiety and depression, alcohol and tobacco addiction, obsessive compulsive disorder, and most recently, treatment resistant major depression. And the third and final study uh, was done between January 2020 and 2021 with over 191 patients over the period of nine weeks. This has been the biggest microdosing experiment to date. This study examined people with anxiety, depression, PTSD, and other conditions. Using a very clever self-blinding technique in which the anonymous participants received either a sugar pill or psilocybin, researchers were able to gain some substantial data. Let's look at that data. Quote, most participants microdosed with LSD, 61%, or an analog of LSD, which is 14%, or psilocybin containing mushrooms, which was 24%. The average reported dosage for LSD was 5.5 UG. So that means it was probably very high quality and uh, it actually was 5.5 micrograms. While for psilocybin mushrooms, it was 0.2. Now, I assume that's because they weren't using this Limentech method that I mentioned earlier. They were probably eating it ground or they were eating it whole. So what we're seeing on this online study versus the placebo-controlled studies seems to be slightly more positive results. Much of the data from this experiment actually is accurate to a p-value of 0 0.0001, which is very, very accurate. Usually, an official scientific press release must meet a minimum p-value of under 0 0.05 to be published. A p-value of 0 0.0001 means that if you ran the experiment a thousand times, you'd get the same result 999 times. 
which is very promising. This study used a self-blinding methodology and was very well put together. Quote, we employed a novel self-blinding methodology to investigate the acute, post-acute, and long-term accumulative effects of psychedelic microdosing. To the best of our knowledge, this study is the first one to use a self-blinding methodology, the first placebo-controlled investigation of the accumulative effects of repeated microdosing, and the largest placebo-controlled psychedelic study to date. When looking at changes over time from a baseline to week 5, which are the accumulative outcomes, in the microdose group alone, results confirmed the psychological benefits reported by anecdotes and observational uncontrolled studies. Significant improvements were observed in the domains of well-being, mindfulness, life satisfaction, and paranoia. However, when looking at the between-group comparisons of the same outcomes, no significant differences were found between this, the placebo and microdose groups. On the cognitive tests, which are less subjective than the self-reported psychological outcomes, the microdose group did not even improve from baseline to week 5, and the between groups comparisons were not significant either. The study validates the positive anecdotal reports about the psychological benefits of microdosing, significant improvements from baseline and a broad range of psychological measures. However, our results also suggest, suggest that these improvements are not due to the pharmacological action of microdosing, but are rather explained by the placebo effect. For the within group, or change over time, comparison of baseline versus week 5, all self-reported psychological outcomes improved significantly in the microdosing group. I'm going to skip over the percentages and just talk about what increased and decreased. So in the microdosing group, well-being increased, mindfulness increased, life satisfaction increased, and paranoia decreased. Personality structures showed reduced neuroticism trait scores and increased openness. Changes in mindfulness and paranoia were sustained at the week 9 follow-up time point for all groups. Quote, in summary, the results seem to suggest that the actual content of the capsules did not determine differences between the conditions, but the beliefs about their content did." End quote. Now this is interesting. They show the same differences between the placebo effect on depression, anxiety, and PTSD that other trials have showed with SSRIs. Now this is going off of research that I did about a year ago, but the results are very clear. All of the data that I've seen since then is, is very much in line with this. We've basically seen 50-50 results on improvements and relief of symptoms and anxiety, depression, and PTSD from people using SSRIs, as well as people using placebo effect. So 50-50 results with placebo and 50-50 results with medication, which says a lot about mind over matter. Trials on anxiety medication only studied the relief of symptoms being 50-50 between placebo and the pill, and not a complete reversal of the symptoms, which is what we seem to be seeing for microdosing and macrodosing. Or at least that it takes a lot less work, and <laughs> that is still relatively unexplained. I mean, the downregulation of the default mode network seems to be very much at play. And the relief of addiction tendencies and the desire to give into addiction, that seems to be completely wiped away for long periods, whereas with SSRIs, it's more of just a, a relief of symptoms. Now, that relief of symptoms is intended for you to work on those problems while it's easier for you, while you're not dealing with as many symptoms, and then uh, hopefully you come out of that a better person. Whereas with psychedelics, it seems to be there's a lot of crazy magic going on with the default mode network where it just resets a lot of the brain and you don't have to put in as much effort. It's almost like cheating. But this is why I'm so interested in this because these effects are so profound and so unexpectedly effective, like very potent effects, very potent beneficial effects, lasting gratitude, lasting humility, feelings of connection with the, with the rest of humanity instead of isolation." Quote, the results are still astonishing either way, and the placebo study reveals just another layer of mystery as to the power and potential of the placebo effect. Believing that one can overcome the issue that they're dealing with seems to be absolutely crucial to making lasting change. End quote. What this means is that we, we have to believe <laughs> that we can overcome, and we have to continuously tell ourselves that. Mantras seem to help, or the recitation of sayings throughout the day seems to reinforce this idea. And that is also a message that I don't think is being communicated by a psychiatrist that probably should, because that <laughs> that should probably also apply to the use of anxiety medication. Honestly, this is a great website with lots of resources, uh, many cutting edge studies that are being released as well. It's the US National Library of Medicine and the National Institute of Health's government website. Whoa, a government website that has reliable information about the benefits of psychedelics? Who'd have thunk it? They have highly detailed studies and experiments that offer ways to participate anonymously. Now we're finally reaping the benefits of a government that's actually taking psychedelic research seriously. However, slowly permissions are being granted for such studies. Much of the series on psychedelic therapy will be emphasizing safety and harm reduction, both physical and mental. As we've seen, the potential for these drugs is huge, and with powerful potential comes great responsibility, I guess you could say. I'll post some links to some websites that you can reach out to for safety advice when using uh, psychedelic substances in entertainment settings as well as personal growth settings, such as uh, dancesafe.org. 
I'll put those in the description. Primarily, with all of these substances, as well as antidepressants, we should be considering set and setting. The mindset that you go into these experiences with, even if it's a microdose or using an anxiety medication of some kind, that is crucial. Yeah, it seems illogical to take these, take any substances and expect them just to work and fix you without any effort from your own part and also without considering your environment. Like if you're in a horrible environment at work, that's not going to be a place for growth and that's not going to be encouraging you to not smoke cigarettes anymore. That's probably going to make it, make it worse. So set and setting is crucial. So what did we learn today? Well, it seems that activation and upregulation of the serotonin molecule, specifically serotonin 5H2A, has a significant impact on the default mode network. I didn't really go into much detail on this before, but the default mode network seems to be quite literally what the brain defaults to when it's not doing something else. And so alteration of that default mode would naturally make us assume that we're going to be expanding our, our perspective on things or at least leading to a less compartmentalized reality. Now these effects are slightly less noticeable, but more easy to control when microdosing, I guess you could say. Now that's very much dependent on the substance and the individual as well, but the idea behind microdosing is that you're supposed to take an amount that's not perceptible. These three studies seem to show strong convergence on improvement in depression and anxiety and OCD and ADHD. And I've noticed significant improvements in my own ADHD and especially OCD. I had what's now known as body-focused repetitive behavior which is specifically biting the insides of my lips and my cheeks to the point of bleeding up until around age 28. So long past the uh, average of 25, the estimate that we have where the brain starts to decline in its neuroplasticity, which I'm not sure I agree with completely, but the method I used was very similar to what Paul Stamets used, which was just reciting mantras about don't beat your face up or don't beat up your human vessel. It's the only one that you've got. I'll go into more details on that in a future video. Well, that's all for today. I really appreciate you watching. If you find this kind of content valuable, please like and subscribe and share this video to help this channel grow. If you believe this video to be worthy of monetization, buy me a Danish on Patreon. That's all for today. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. If you view the video, watching